And so where is all of this incremental spending going? Is it going to the Defense Department? Sometimes I think I read that. The reality is, going back to 1970, defense as a share of government outlays has been declining. Is it going to service all of this debt? We have this huge debt pile, but remember, interest rates are low, so that debt's actually pretty cheap, and so we're not spending much on the debt. If that changes, by the way, that's a huge problem. All of the incremental expenditures that the government is making is going to the bloated entitlement system. And by the way, we're only in the early innings. If you look at, this was a, uh, a, an, an ex, in the book, in the bibliography that you've got, there are a couple of books in there that are specific to global debt piles. They're very short. They're worth reading. They'll make you the smartest person on any tee box in America. So you might want to pick them up. But I extrapolated some of this for you in a chart. This is the US general government net debt projections as a percentage of GDP going out to 2035. Notice that the government only talks about the next 10 years. Oh, we got, got $4 trillion over the next 10 years. We got 10 year this, 10 year that. The reason they're not talking about anything past 10 years is because of this chart. Again, this was put together in the middle of last year. And so if you look at debt to GDP, Here's about where we are currently at about 80% or 85% net. Here's what happens as we get out to 2035. That's assuming we don't have a major crisis. Here's Europe, okay? So just from an order of magnitude, who's in better shape, us or Europe? Europe is actually in better shape, believe it or not, because they've got some constraint over their medical expenditures. Now, this is bad news. The good news is we have time to solve this problem. We have until about 2020, until net debt to GDP at the government level hits this magical barrier of 90% where it's supposed to then significantly retard economic growth. So the bad news is we're headed that direction. The good news is we've got eight years to figure it out. And so likely for that to occur, we're going to have to change the leadership. And that appeals to most Americans. So right now, where we are in the election cycle, I think Obama's approval rating is 48%. Historically, if your approval rating is below the danger threshold of 50%, you do not get reelected, a la Johnson, Carter, and Bush won. As sentiment rises, though, I will tell you the approval of the president comes along with it. And so this isn't a political comment, but if we end up getting higher levels of sentiment, that bodes well for the Obama camp. What about Congress? Uh, well, compared to Congress, Obama looks like prom king, okay? So a pro Congress's approval rating right now, 9%, is a little lower than Nixon during Watergate, BP during the oil spill, Paris Hilton in general, and <laughs> Hugo Chavez uh, edges us out a little bit, but we can be proud because we are fractionally more popular than Fidel Castro. Okay. So with the developed economies burdened with a lot of debt and run by feckless politicians, where will growth come from? Growth comes from where the people come from. So this is a chart put together by me, but using UN data. Going back to 1950, the green line is the developed world. The old world, us, Europe, Japan, etc. And you can see that our population, which is about 1.3 to 5 billion, I guess, isn't growing anywhere. While at the same time, the new world, the emerging markets, are continuing to grow their populations considerably. And so today, there are 7 billion people on the planet, 2100, there'll be 10 billion people on the planet. All of those people will be born outside of the developed world. Just to give you a little bit more scale on these population metrics, the US has about 300 million people, Europe has about 300 million people, China, India, Indonesia, and Brazil combined have three billion people. So we are 10%, add us to Europe, we're 20% of that small group of nations in terms of population. This is the big story. The big story is as the globe populates, it's also moving people towards the cities, right? Where they're much more productive. So here's the percentage of rural population on the planet, what about 70% in 1950, and scheduled to go towards 40 and 30% as we get out to 2050. 
Here is the world's urban population. We're at this kind of magic moment on the planet where 50% of the global population is urban and 50% is rural, but that is going to change. The United States, by the way, is about 85% urbanized, I think. Developed countries are 70%. As we go from 50% urban on the planet to 70% urban, that's gonna take a lot of cement, it's gonna take a lot of steel, it's gonna take a lot of oil, it's gonna mean a lot of jobs, it's gonna mean a lot of productivity, it's gonna mean higher standard of living. This is the big story. This is my favorite slide. Economic nirvana for an economist is more people plus more productivity. That equals more economy, okay? This chart takes people and productivity in the advanced economies, shows you what the contribution is to growth rates, versus the emerging economies. See that huge growth in labor productivity? That is a function of moving from the farm to the city, and that is what's powering global GDP growth. And it's also creating customers.